Welcome to AC 1002 Lecture 18. This, this uh, lecture covers uh, roof construction. When we looked at previous lectures, we talked about timber frame construction and the envelope and the variety of layers that we needed to install within that envelope um, and how they would perform quite a complicated and complex role. And many of those principles can be applied to roof construction. It still needs to keep us dry. It needs to prevent heat loss. It needs to be able to transfer loads. And it needs to be able to deal with vapor within the construction. So the principles from the previous lectures um, need to be applied to this. This lecture is going to look at the basic principles of a, a simple truss roof, um, more from the, the structural and constructional point of view and uh, it won't really be looking at complex shapes. They'll be covered in, in future modules. So our basic shape for a, a roof is a triangle. We have a truss, a pitched roof in, in this country um, as the predominant shape. And this tends to be the same for most places that, that get um, a significant amount of rainfall. We want to be able to take the rain uh, that hits the building away from the building down to the eaves into the gutter and take it away from the building as quickly as we possibly can. So we install a, a, a pitched roof shape to allow gravity to, to help us do that, um, to avoid the, the possibility of water water getting into the building. So there's our, our little man in his, in his house and we've got our pitched roof shape. And any roof is going to have loads applied to it. It's going to have dead loads. Um, its own weight, the weight of the materials, the slates, the tiles, whatever it is, and any live loads, uh, snow, uh, water sitting onto it. And those are going to be pushing downwards through the, the, the construction and uh, hopefully be taken down through the walls and down to the foundations. But the tendency for that simple shape under load uh, would be for it to deform um, sideways, the, the building would want to spread or the roof shape would want to spread, the eaves would want to, to push outwards. So we need to find a method to stop that or to mitigate against that. And the normal way would be to, to transfer our pitched roof shape to a triangle so that we can install something at the bottom of the, the, the triangle to um, restrict the, the pulling force of those two uh, eaves pulling apart. So we would install something at the bottom which works in tension. And if you think back to earlier lectures where we talked about compression and tension, um, when those two points are wanting to move apart, we need something in that point that's going to be under tension. So within our house, we probably have um, a triangle for our roof, which starts to become a, a truss. And a truss is a, is a system. The um, sloping elements going up towards the, the peak are the, the rafters and the, the red element shown in this image here would be the, um, the tie uh, which ties them together. It's sometimes called a, um, a, a collar um, across the, the bottom or if it's further up the, the roof, but effectively it works the same way as it's tying the two together and working in tension. So, transferring our basic diagram into something that looks a little bit more like a construction element. What we're talking about for timber frame is usually timber elements, um, which would be a mixture of rafters, which are the elements that go up towards the peak, um, the slope, and then the, uh, the tie that comes across the bottom. And when we apply our load to to that simple shape, we can see that uh, the load coming downwards onto the roof is going to push these things downward. They are not going to be able to spread from that point outwards and they're constrained at the wall head so they end up under compression and this element along the bottom ends up in tension. And that's okay for, for very small roofs. Um, but as soon as we start to get larger we either have to make these elements much thicker to be able to deal with um, the, the span from the top to the bottom, or the roof would start to deform. 
so it would start to bend inwards if it, if it was relatively small elements. So we tend to make roofs a little bit more complex and uh, you know, a very simple version would be to install uh, various posts and struts within that to um, kind of increase the, the efficiency of, of the, the truss as a system. And if we apply loads back onto that, we see that the various elements start to work in slightly different ways. We're, we're still pressing downwards um, onto the roof for the, the weight of it, um, but some of that load's actually been pushed downwards to, to this point here where these two elements are constrained against each other so they end up working in compression, they're being squeezed in length and because this point here is then being pushed downwards by those two loads the post element in the middle ends up working in tension um, and the two ties or the, the single tie along the bottom works in tension so the, the whole thing uh, for a wider roof um, would have to be a bit more complex and we would have to consider what the, the various roles of all these struts and, and posts would be within that system. And there's a number of different ways that we can we can frame these things. We can have a very simple roof which is our, our uh, king post uh, in the top corner um, going through to the fink truss which is probably one of the more common that we would see um, in, in, in house building, volume house building. Um, we would then, if it was a longer span, we'd maybe be looking at something like the, the double W at that point. The ones that say cantilever, um, what, they're, what they're really talking about is the fact that they're supported at those points there and we have a, a width of the cantilever um, or a width of the truss that then projects out beyond that. So. So these are very similar ways to do it. If we were looking to, to occupy a space, we might use the, the room and the roof truss down at the bottom to be able to give us space that we can occupy. And we'll look at a couple of those in, in a little bit more detail. So if we took a truss for a typical eight meter span, uh, and by eight meter span, I mean spanning from those two supports uh, across that distance there, that would be our, that would be our eight meters. And because it's working as a system, we can actually use relatively light timbers. We can use a, a rafter, which is 35 by 97, so that's 30 mil, 35 millimetres thick by uh, 97 millimetres deep. And the ceiling tie is the same size, and this results in, in quite a light um, frame. So it's 55 kilograms. It's probably capable of being lifted into place or manoeuvred into place by, by two men. If we wanted to uh, occupy the space, so if we were going to create a, a room up here for this guy, I'll try and draw him with my mouse, there we go, um, to have a, a room up there, because we don't have the, the reinforcement or the, the, the um, strutting within it, we actually then have to use much bigger timber. So our rafters become uh, much larger, they become thicker and they become deeper. And the same with the, the, the ceiling joists. We're, we're pressing down on, on here with furniture and uh, people and uh, we, we wouldn't want that to, to sort of deform downwards. And the result of that is that the, the truss becomes much, um, much heavier. It becomes 125 kilograms versus, versus 55. So to occupy the space, we end up with a much heavier construction. And the way that most... Um, trusses are made is they tend to be uh, timber um, white wood uh, which is a kind of or spruce or pine or, some, or something along those lines um, most of them are treated timber so they, they're treated with something to, to stop insects attacking them um, and if you think back to the, uh, the traditional um, timber construction lecture where we're looking at the history of timber frame where most of the joints were made by um, uh, joiners making uh, mortise and tenons and putting pegs through. Modern trusses tend to be made by uh, using gangnail plates. So these are metal plates, galvanized steel plates, and uh, there's a series of holes that are punched into the top of the plate, and that fold, that little hole then folds out and becomes effectively a little flat nail. So on this plate, there, there's uh, you know tens or 
perhaps a hundred, I don't know, I'm not going to count them, um, numbers of little nails that can come across and that spans between two pieces of timber and then is pressed into place and that, that acts to join them, them together. And then to make a, a single roof from a, a number of different trusses, it really is a, a case of, of uh, laying them side to side and the, the spacing between them tends to be uh, 600 millimetres, so 600 millimetres is a standard size that we, we use all the time and I've talked to you about this before, it's um, related back to standard lengths of or widths of building materials and these trusses would be would be set uh, one against the other to to join them together and, and, and make sure that, that any uh, any kind of forces pushing against them in in various directions can be shared amongst the whole roof it would be normal to install a number of uh, bracing rails or bracing rods so we would have um, smaller pieces of timber that would be placed into the, the truss within the depth of the, the roof and they would be nailed into place to, to help it deal with the forces as a, as a single element. Additionally there is a diagonal bracing rod, that was a bit of a wonky line but you get the idea, um, that runs top to bottom diagonally through the roof and that allows the, the roof to be to be braced. Um, in Scotland we, we would probably over um, or, or omit some of these bracing things because we can use uh, rigid sheeting on, on the roof uh, but we'll come to that later on. So we can see here that um, there's a kind of roof under construction. We've got our uh, gang nail plates that uh, are, are making the joints between the various pieces of timber. Um, we have uh, trusses going off at regular centres and uh, at this point here we can see that there's a truss that's actually joined together. There's two trusses together and that would be, be nailed into place and, and we might start to use these trusses which uh, are sometimes referred to as girder trusses to um, carry larger loads and in this case it looks like there's going to be a larger opening and we have another piece of timber that then rests onto this truss so this truss has to be be much much stronger to be able to take the extra load coming onto it so we would put two trusses or three trusses back to back and the ability to form different roof, sh roof shapes or complex roof shapes um, using uh, various trusses um, is is almost limitless where it comes to uh, pitched roof shapes we can we can use all sorts of different types of trusses or different shapes of trusses um, to turn corners, to have uh, intersections and gables and um, if we look at a, a couple of the, the, the details of that um, we can see that using different types of trusses or different types of rafters um, in, in unison we can form a flat top hip or uh, an L return or a T intersection. We'll look at the T intersection a little bit more uh, detail, a little bit more closely. So what we have here is standard uh, trusses that, that span out that way and they're repeated across the roof at uh, regular centres and they come down to a, a common point down at that point there where they would sit onto this uh, yellow element which is a, a compound girder. So from the, the, a couple of slides ago when I was talking about um, where a truss has to carry a, a, a more significant load so we would double them up or triple them up. This is a, a, a triple um, how truss that's uh, nailed together and it's taking the ends of all these other uh, white trusses onto it and it's, uh, it's spreading the, the load down. And then to be able to fill in the gap behind that we would use ever decreasing triangles uh, or smaller trusses to be able to form um, the shape as it, as it meets the, the roof behind it and that would then form a, a valley which runs down the, the roof in that kind of shape which on this little diagram is, is that part there. So how would we take these trusses and actually make them part of our system? Most trusses are 
going to be delivered to site, uh, manufactured off site by a, a specialist um, trust manufacturer. There's plenty of them about, and they would do the engineering for it. They would figure out the loads. They would figure out the size of the the timbers, um, based on a design drawing that we would we would give them, and we would normally install these at the same centres as the, the the trusses. So we would try and and match them up so that the loads were being able to be transferred directly down from from truss down uh, through the frame and right the way down to uh, the foundation at the at the bottom there. And the way that they're attached to the roof is by means of a, a truss clip. So this is a, another galvanized steel element that um, allows, uh, it's got a number of nail holes within it and that allows it to be fixed to the frame. And then there's a, a pocket um, within that that allows the, the, the truss to be able to sit into that and then we can nail that sideways. So it's a way of being able to create a joint that, that changes direction. And that stops the roof being able to, or the possibility of the roof being uplifted by, by wind blowing into it. So it brings it back into the, the whole timber frame as a system. And then once we have that installed, the layers are very similar to uh, the timber frame beneath it. We have a, a rigid board, which um, in Scotland is, is called sarking, and that uh, prevents the, the roof from racking, keeps the, um, the, 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 the trusses in, in line, stops lateral forces from distorting it. And it also provides a, a, a nice surface to be able to, to nail slates or to fit battens for, for roof tiles and to fit a, a breather membrane. And in Scotland, traditionally, this would be timber boards. We would, we would use um, 20 by 125 treated timber boards um, with a little penny gap between them. So that's a, a gap about the, the depth of a, a penny, uh, so like two millimeters or something like that. And that just allows any, uh, any a little bit of air movement between it. And then over the top, we've got our, our breather membrane. So it's very similar construction to, to the side of the wall where we have sheathing and uh, breather membrane before we have our, our covering. Um, we would do the same on the, the roof. The little note they are saying in England, they tend not to use this this rigid uh, board, but um, what they would tend to do is allow the breather membrane to sag between the rafters so there's not, nothing rigid there, so they would need a lot more bracing. So in conclusion, a standard pitched roof needs to be designed to deal with the, the loads that are applied to it, so that could be dead loads and live loads and it needs to be able to transfer those loads downwards um, through the roof to the foundation. Um, but because there's loads applied to it, there's a possibility that the, the roof could deform. So we need something uh, at uh, eaves level to be able to prevent that, to stop it from pulling apart. So aspects that you should take from this lecture are that a uh, tie beam is required to stop the truss from spreading that uh, when we have a wide span of a truss, the truss either needs to be heavier or more complex, and that complicated roof shapes, so uh, gables and, and, and T intersections can be formed using standard trusses and specialist items, and that the roof is attached to the timber frame by means of truss clips. Okay, in the following lecture we'll look at um, where we would put insulation Within a, within a roof and the, the two basic types of, of roof um, with regard to, to insulation and ventilation and some of the, the layers that are involved and some of the materials that we might make the roof from. So thank you very much for listening and uh, if you've got any comments about the lectures, please let me know.